Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive functions. This show is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. These conversations will introduce mental tools that will empower you to shift your mindset for a successful life. And now, here's your host, Sucheta Kamath. Welcome back to Full Prefrontal, where we are exposing the mysteries of executive function. As always, I am here with our host, Sucheta Kamath. Good morning, Sucheta. So why are you going to be talking about pie? Now, I'm not talking about the pie that I like to eat. We're talking about the pie that is known around the world as 3.14. What do you mean by that? Yes, great to be with you, Todd. And uh, yes, we are going to talk a little bit about pie. And I will connect that to our story in a second. But every math enthusiast knows that pi is the mathematical constant that represents the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. One spectacular element of the pi is that it is an irrational number. And that implies that the, it's a real number that cannot be expressed by a simple fraction. With that, uh, there is no exact value of pi. Therefore, it is known as an infinite decimal, which means after the decimal point, the digits in pi go on forever. And some pi enthusiasts and committed uh, computer scientists or computer programmers have calculated the value of pi more than 22 trillion digits. So that's a little bit about the pi, which is uh, now again, why do we care? But, you know, every March 14th, this particular day is celebrated globally as the Pi Day because the date spells out uh, 3.14 of the Pi. <laughs> and uh, people like me just simply satisfy with a slice of real pie on that day. But uh, there are many who enter competitions. And one particular uh, thing I would like to share that in 2015, the event was even more special because for the first time in a century, the date represented the first five digits of the Pi, which was 3.14.15. So on March 21st, 2015, something incredible happened. The VIT University in Valor, India, held its competition and a brilliant candidate, Rajiv Meena, from, I think he must have been from VIT University, but successfully recalled, get this, Todd, 70,000 decimal places of the pie. Wow. I can't even imagine that. (laughs) I know. Well, listen to this. The whole recall took close to 10 hours. And Rajiv uh, was blindfolded (laughs) throughout this memory test, apparently. And uh, Rajiv broke the Guinness World Record of reciting 67,890 digits of pi, which was held uh, since 2005 by Lu Chao of China. Now, you are wondering why am I talking about the pi? Well, mostly I'm trying to, I'm talking about memory. And memory is an enigma to an average Joe, a person who doesn't know anything about neuroscience, executive function, cognition. Everybody knows memory. And typically, a layman or a common person associates um, high intelligence with great memory skills. And you and I have always encountered people in our lives who have phenomenal memory. I, in fact, had a friend, my husband's friend in college who would literally sit in an easy chair browse through Gray's Anatomy. They both went to medical school. And as he flipped through the pages, he would actually, somehow, it would become part of his memory. And when he took tests, he could imagine the page, you know, whether it was left left side, right side, page number, uh, the images that were on the page and everything he could recall. And of course, you can imagine he aced all the tests. So the question comes to mind, is memory a gift or a skill? And that's why we're going to talk about our guest today. Our guest is a professor of neuroscience at Texas A&M University, and his name is Dr. William Clem, who has served as a project director for two NIH grants and two other grants from NSF, all aimed at developing science curricula for grades six to eight. Professor William Clem studied basic and applied research on learning and memory and has published 20 books. He's a distinguished lecturer and the the Scientific Research Society contributor. He provides teachers with lectures and workshops on teaching and learning. He has over 2.5 million views of his posts on learning and memory at Psychology Today. He's a prolific blogger, 
and he has his own blog, which we, we will be linking in this podcast. An interesting fact about him is that he is a retired colonel in the U.S. Air Force Reserve of Research and Development Planning Human System Division. He is also a company president. He which he co-founded a company called Forum Enterprise, which is a maker of collaboration software. So we have a very talented, interesting, fascinating speaker that uh, we will get started with very soon. What do you think, Todd? Well, as usual, Sucheta, I always look forward to these conversations. Uh, and I'm still thinking about Rajiv and 10 plus hours of recitation of pi. I, I don't even know the third decibel, for goodness sake. So... That's an amazing story, and I have a feeling this is going to be an amazing conversation. So let's get to it. Here is Sucheta's conversation with Dr. William Clem. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Clem. It's such a pleasure to have you. Yeah, it's great to be here. So let me start. You are such a prolific writer and a researcher, and as a neuroscientist, how do you define memory? And can you help us understand a little bit about the biology of memory and its relationship uh, to daily life and how best to understand it? Well, memory is what you remember. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And it occurs in two forms, the the active working memory, which uh, I noticed that you mentioned in your TED Talk, and also the um, stored memory, which is stored in long term. The active memory, or the working memory, is actually generated by a pattern of nerve impulses in various parts of the brain that happen to be processing the information associated with this memory. And as long as that pattern of impulses is uh, operating or flowing, you have access to that information. On the other hand, if that pattern should change because you start thinking about something else or you get a new stimulus, then you've lost it unless you have thought about it enough so that it gets stored in long-term form. And the storage in long-term form is actually an anatomical biochemical change in the synapses or junctions between nerve cells in those circuits that handle that information. I don't know if that tells you enough or not. Absolutely. So it's so interesting that there's a fading quality to that temporary storage, which is referred as working memory, as or you also called it active memory. And that means it's not so much out of sight, out of mind, but it's literally the minute you stop holding on to it while working with it. Uh, and if it disappears and you're no longer holding on to it, it disappears. And so that's the working memory. And so in order to move things into stored memory or long-term memory, what kind of process is involved in that? Actually, it's a a protein synthesis change in the synapses of the neurons, and that takes a little time. And this conversion process is crucial for making memories last. Otherwise, you'll forget them. You 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 may remember it, of course, while you're thinking about it, but if you don't get it stored, if you don't get these protein synthesis changes occurring, you're going to lose it. And there are many practical implications of this consolidation phenomenon, it's called, and it relates to interference of information. In other words, if you're trying to memorize something and there's some interfering stimulus or information, it will prevent this consolidation process. This is a real problem in in education, that uh, there's so many distractions going on in the classroom that it's easy to just erase your active memory and, and it doesn't get preserved in, in long-term form. This is the problem with multitasking. You jump from thinking about one thing to another thing to another thing. And every time you make this jump, you're interfering with what it was that you had learned temporarily and prevented you from learning permanently. Got it. And so as you are learning you need adequate attention and focus. And then in order for it to become a part of your long-term memory, you need some sort of processes that uh, that information has to go through some process. So do you mind uh, what contributes to the memorization process itself? What are the key elements of that? Well, the first one is attention, as you point out, and focus where you don't get distracted by other kinds of thoughts or stimuli. And then you have to protect this information. And recall that I said that uh, you have this pattern of nerve impulses flowing around in circuits, and and they contain the information. And 
And that pattern has got to be sustained long enough to help initiate these protein synthesis changes in your synapses so that you can store it permanently. And this requires rehearsal, you know, thinking about the same thing again and again. And it also requires uh, protecting it from distractions and interference. Now, how, how rapidly it gets consolidated it depends on lots of things. In other words, how important is it to you? Does it have emotional appeal? Is it uh, an intense uh, magnitude of stimulus or information? Is it relevant to some immediate problem you have? You know, how much emphasis or priority you give it? Uh, those kinds of things will speed it up. It will speed up the consolidation process. And then how about the recall and the role of queuing to bring that information out? Is that part of also memory, memorization process? Yeah, yeah. And interest, I'm glad you asked that question because there hasn't been much research on retrieval. Anecdotally, we know, of course, that if you can think of some cues or some items that were associated with the original memory, they may help you retrieve it. But this whole process of retrieval is not understood very well. There's been a lot. There's been a lot of research on consolidation, but been very little on retrieval. And, and I think, in part, it's because we don't know how to study retrieval. <laughs> you know, I, in my practice, I work with a lot of people. My practice focuses on concussion and brain injuries, and uh, those are the individuals who struggle with actually forming new memories. And one of the processes, you know, the training process involves in focusing on self cueing and recall. And I use the analogy of a tea bag. You know, if you put a tea, or you have hot water and you put the tea bag, you need that little thread with that uh, paper rectangle that you tug on to pull it out, pull the tea bag out. And so the retrieval cue is forming a, a strong thread that you can pull on so that you can get the tea bag out, even though the analogy is not best because you don't want the tea bag is not the what stores the memory, but the infused water is. But never mind. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And, and these cues are very important aid in, in retrieving information, which brings up this point. When you memorize something in the first place, it's strengthened by having uh, lots of other items associated with it, because those other things will serve as cues later on. And if you can remember some of the cues, they will help you retrieve the basic information that you uh, wanted to save in the first, first place. So I tend to remember uh, information a lot by spatial cues, you know, where I was sitting, what I was wearing, uh, what kind of environment yeah, I was absolutely. in. So that and, seems and the, to trigger a lot of my thoughts about stories or where event took place. And I seem to be able to reconstruct that. And that acts as a um, tool to remind me what exactly the exchange was about. Can you tell us a little bit about why that's a good way to think or there are other ways to do it, too? but what is that all about? Well, the part of the brain that um, forms or, or does this conversion from short-term to long-term memory is called the hippocampus. And there are cells in the hippocampus that do something different. They map location in space, and apparently they help map information spatially. And so, and so, so here you have a system in the brain that does both things that are complementary. In other words, where information is helps you remember what the information is. And you, you're you not unusual in that regard. That's a basic brain property. Thank God. One, one thing about me that's normal here. <laughs> so tell me why some people have good memory and some people have terrible memory. And I'm not talking about having some incurred some injury. But I like to describe Velcro memory, information that goes in without much effort or at least appearance of external process of making intentional association rehearsal, and these individuals seem to remember so much more effectively than those who need a lot of extraneous effort or explicit effort. Do well, we have I'm, any understanding why? I'm not sure there's been much research on, on individual differences, but I can speculate on reasons why some people have poor memories. One is they don't pay attention very well. They don't get the information registered or encoded robustly. Another is they're easily distracted. And in fact, this is a problem with old age and also with children, which is kind of an interesting comparison. But it's a fact that uh, children and in old age, you tend to be more distractible. 
And if you're distracted, then, of course, you interfere with this consolidation process. And, and finally, I think it, it, uh, an important factor is how much value you place on memory. If you want to memorize, you're more likely to be able to do it. You know, this brings me to this idea of executive functions. So executive function, as you know, are the supervisory skills that assess value of information, purpose, they connect actions to um, intentions with act, to actions, and they see that goal is pursued. And I find this very often that particularly the ADHD children and young adults and college kids that I work with, that they appear to have bad memory, as you mentioned, uh, primarily because of inattention or lack of attention to detail. But second is their lack of understanding of value and importance of that information in the future. So they're not future oriented. They don't understand that if I don't understand this content in front of me, when I get tested on it three weeks down the road, I will not be able to use it. And so there's a very little effort in their ability to stay connected to the intent of that particular exchange of information. Do you see that as well? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, one problem I think a lot of students have is they have a short-term horizon for their learning. In other words, the idea is to learn the information for the next quiz. And they don't have, they tend not to have a goal for learning it forever. And of course, if you want to develop real expertise, you need to learn things with the goal of remembering it forever, not just for the next quiz. Yes. And you see that a lot of uh, modern education, I came across this uh, research somewhere about people were asked, about their memory and people equated their capacity to retrieve information from Google, same as their capacity to retrieve information from their brains. So I was, I was invited to give a keynote express at the Learning and Brain Conference in San Francisco, and the title of my talk was Google in Memory. And, you know, Google has conditioned us to diminish the emphasis we put on memory because we can always go look it up. But that's not how you develop expertise in, in any field. You need it in your head, not on the Internet. You know, I grew up in India, and we have a very strong oral tradition, particularly in the spiritual context. And, you, you know, our scriptures are 5,000 years old, but the writing came much later in the, so, so to speak, on, on board. But before that, it was oral tradition to pass information from one uh, generation to another by kind of memorizing. And there was such a, so when I grew, went to school, I learned tables, uh, mathematical tables. So you memorize multiplication tables, you know, as far into it, like 25, you know, or 30, uh, 30 times one, 30 times two, 30 times three. And I don't see that when I my race, my both my boys in US and they were not at all taught any memorization skills. In fact, uh, they uh, almost uh, were taught to be looking down upon memorization skills. So what are your thoughts about that? That's my pet peeve about education. They, they're so focused on teaching children what to learn that they don't teach them how to learn. And these memory skills need to be taught, but they're not taught to the teachers. The teachers don't teach it because they don't know either. Yes, and, yes. And so that reminds me, I'm, I'm writing, helping write curriculum for middle school. And in, in our lessons, I have a section in there where I teach the memory skills in the specific context of the content they're expected to memorize. In other words, I'll give them some tips on how to memorize this or how to memorize that and so forth. And the techniques differ, of course, depending on what the information is. So can we walk through some strategies? Do you mind sharing with us? What are some fundamental memory strategies? And is there like a, a homegrown ways of kind of improving well, your memory on your own? Uh, what, one thing uh, that you should be doing at the outset is to think about a strategy for how you're going to re learn a, a given batch of material. And, and that, that's a little different depending on the subject matter, whether it's math or, or chemistry or history or whatever, the strategies will be a little different. In, in this context, it, it, once you understand the, the challenges, uh, then you should organize the information in a way that makes it easy to remember. And this may be done um, with different kinds of notes or drawings or organizing uh, files and reference sources and things of that sort. 
Now, in terms of the actual memory, the most important thing of all is to use mental images, not words. Words are very hard to memorize for everybody, but mental images are very easy to memorize for everybody. And one reason is that the whole back of your head is devoted to vision, whereas your language involves two small areas in the brain about the size of a quarter a piece. <laughs> and so you just don't have as many neural resources available for, for words that you do for vision. So the, the more robust memory techniques involve turning your information into mental pictures. That, that relate to the, the words that you're, you're trying to memorize. And there are several techniques for this. And one of them evolved thousands of years ago in this oral tradition that you talked about in India. Uh, the, the most famous technique was originated in, in ancient Greece, where these orators would give speeches lasting for hours, and Taking, they, they yeah. did it all from memory. And they used a technique called memory palace. Memory palace. And memory, memory palace is a technique where you try to relate the new information to information you already know, and you do it in the form of images. Now, the information you already know, or your palace, so to speak, might be your home. You know, but the objects in the kitchen, or the objects in the living room, or the objects in the dining room. You don't have to memorize that. You already know what they are. So in a memory, a memory palace technique, you take a new item inf of information, like a word, let's say you're memorizing vocabulary, and you convert it into an image, and then you mentally attach it to an object in your palace, in your dining room or in your kitchen or whatever. It can also be on objects, you know, like locations in your car or on your bicycle or, you know, all sorts of things that serve as anchor points for attaching these mental images of the things you are, are trying to memorize. Now, you can also use the same approach in what I call story chains, where you can take the information you're trying to remember, convert it into mental images, and then make a story out of it. And, and stories are fairly easy to remember. We, you know, that's just the way our brains are wired. And it's kind of an entertaining way to memorize, too. And then there's just a simple approach, what I call it subject, object, and verb, because that's the way our language is. And here the idea is is you take the item you're trying to memorize and make a sentence out of it, but it's a visual sentence. In other words, you, you see these items as a, as a subject or, and a, a verb and an object. For instance, if you wanted to remember the uh, capital of Arkansas, which is Little Rock, you might ask yourself, well, when I think of Arkansas, what's the first thing I think of? Oh, Bill Clinton. Okay, you got this mental image of what Bill Clinton looks like. And then now you have an image of people throwing rocks at him for the sexual uh, misadventures that he conducted. So you, now you have this little rock being thrown at, 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 a, at a guy from Arkansas, and it helps you remember that little rock is the capital. So that's, a real, that's the simplest approach that you can use for almost everything. <laughs> got it. Got it. So, and um, I also use pegging method, which is also... Well, yeah, been... these, these, are, these are pegging methods, but, but yeah. there's another peg method, and maybe that's what you're referring to, based on numbers, where... Numbers, yeah. Numbers, I was referring to pegging number with... You're, yeah. You're familiar with that technique. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I don't mind if you and, and, and that. It's the same yeah. basic idea. You, you have an image for each number, and you uh, and you make images of what you're trying to remember and attach it to the image for your each number in the peg. This is a good way to memorize every page or the essence of every page in a book. Exactly. You can, so it's really, in fact, when I was in high school, my dad was a salesman for the Dale Carnegie course. And, and when they're trying to recruit people oh, to really? sign up. Oh, really? Yeah. And when they're trying to get people to sign up, you know, they, they want to show off the the material in this course. And one of, one of the aspects of the course was this peg system using numbers. And so he, he taught it to me, and, and I guess I was turned into a shill because I uh, would put on displays for the audience of memorizing a magazine. You know, and, and they would say to the audience at the beginning of the meeting, now, now here we have this magazine that Billy has never seen, 
We're going to give it to him now, and in 30 minutes we'll come back and test him, and he'll be able to tell you what's on every page. Or you can tell him what's on a page, and he'll tell you what the page number is. And I could do that. I was so so excited to be able to do that. It's really that's so great. My God, you so your father turned you into a neuroscientist. Well, I that's, didn't realize it was happening at the time. Yeah, but you you got fascinated or discovered maybe this gift you had uh, for easily processing complex information and creating some wonderful system for yourself. Yeah, and it's and, and it has some. Even when you're not using the techniques, it, I, I think it stimulates your your creativity, your imagination, which makes it easier to generate associations that you're trying to use as cues for remembering. You mentioned about organizing information, you know, notes, notes files, uh, reference sources. But I find that a lot of people who struggle with disorganization don't have the organizational principles. You know, uh, underneath the organizational process is that categorization and systematic making connections with information using features or characteristics of information. And they don't yeah. have that complex ability to identify the backbone of information so they don't see similarity or differences or connectivity. And that's one of the reasons they find information to be much more separate than cohesive. Do you... Well, our, our brains really are wired to categorize things. Maybe they just don't know how valuable that is to put things in categories. And, and if you put similar things in the same category, it makes it, if you remember one or two things in that category, it helps you remember the rest in that same category. You know, one of my favorite examples about that, as you mentioned, the brain is wired to categorize. You know, Steve Jobs once gave interview and he uh, talked about this um, iPod came out with a shuffle function. And uh, that was like the greatest innovation of the time that you don't go in a chronological order, but random order. And then people would started complaining that they are they have heard the song. And so he put his team behind it. And then they found that actually it wasn't that the, the song was repeating itself consecutively, but people had these associations that they believed that this song is very similar to another song, so they would feel that both the songs were the same. <laughs> <laughs> so they wouldn't distinguish the two. Well, as we come to the end of this discussion, do you have any thoughts about memory in general and how to maintain healthy memory into our yester years? Well, now, now we need to talk about physiology <laughs> and medicine. <laughs> because if you're not physically healthy, you're not mentally healthy. And if you're not mentally healthy, you won't have a good memory. So, and as, as we age, of course, we, we, we start to, de our health starts to deteriorate and so does our memory. And I, I, for older people, I think when they see that they are having memory problems, they, they need to start working more on their health. They need to do more exercise. They need to do more mental activity and they need to improve their diet, which is usually poor, and then their memory will improve. Exercise, for reasons nobody really understands, uh, helps memory a lot. And, 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 of course, older people tend not to want to do much exercise. You know, they want to sit on the couch and watch TV. Yes, you know, I interviewed Dr. Ken Kosick, who is a researcher known for Alzheimer's, and um, one of the messages for that he was sharing that this process of memory deterioration or changes, physi physiological changes begin 20 years before the actual symptoms become concerning yeah, it, those individuals. The typical <laughs> person starts to deteriorate around the 40s. Exactly. And so, as you're mentioning, it sounds like it's a good good thing to start adapting a, a healthy lifestyle, but more um, very physically engaged or active uh, life uh, will contribute to memory, which is not a lot of times yeah, people think. You need to do it for a lifetime, not wait till you're 70 to start being healthy. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh. Well, thank you so much for your wonderful wisdom and great thoughts. I'm going to link a lot of your articles on this topic and your a couple of books, and that will be also a great resource for all the listeners. Uh, I can thank you for your time, and uh, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Okay, well, I've enjoyed it too. Thank you. All right. Great, great conversation with Dr. Clem Shicheta. Really enjoyed that one. Any initial thoughts as we uh, sit back and think and reflect on that great, great talk? 
Yeah, no, just I think uh, I started off by saying, is memory a gift? Or is it a skill? And I hope people take away this idea that memory is a skill and we must work on it. Just don't be bedazzled by those who have this Velcro memory (laughs) where everything glues to their brain. And for some, if it's effortful, don't uh, minimize that or poo-poo that as, um, oh, I'm so bad. I often hear that somehow people believe that they are supposed to be having decent memory or they are very quick to test their memory. But I rarely hear people investigate and explore their own memory skills. You know, this reminds me of a story of Jonathan Four. He was a New York Times reporter, science reporter, and he did a story on um, memory athletes. And so when he got to this these competitions where people would enter, uh, literally annually enter into the arena to test their memory, and there would be different, different competitions such as the fastest ways you will recall all number of uh, playing cards or the number of numbers you can recall in a minute or things like that. And so he got so fascinated that he worked with a memory champion for a year. And then he himself, you know, took part in the competition and won. (laughs) And he went on writing this incredible book, which I highly recommend everybody to read. It's called Moonwalking with Einstein. So yes, there are living examples of people who have turned their memories on its head. So, uh, you know, uh, Sternberg in 1999 said that memory is the means by which we draw on our past experiences in order to use this information in the present. And so it really like the memory is extremely contextually sensitive. It has this nature of uh, acting as a catalog and we have a way to reference back or go through the, you know, that those that filing cabinet and of course, the most important thing that we will be nothing without memory, and it's it's essential to our existence. It it links this past and kind of allows us to envision the future. So, if I can say finally that the you know memory in its essence brings meaning to human experience in the given moment. So, I, mean, I didn't realize, frankly, that you know the invisible parts of the memorization process were quite as complex. Comment on that, please. <laughs> yes. You know, so interesting. So people literally think that when we are exposed to information, we are memorizing it. And as, uh, you know, uh, Bill kind of uh, pointed out that, no, it has like these five important components. You know, there's registering information or paying attention to it, you know, actively making associations and, uh, and personalizing information and then rehearsing information throughout the passage of time until it kind of begins to all those associations you have made kind of become begin to strengthen and finally consolidation process so that meaning it becomes part of past, past uh, connecting with past knowledge. And finally, like uh, memory is nothing if you can recall it, it's queuing and recalling the information. The most important thing I thought uh, we'll quickly talk about the takeaway here is that attention is the true gateway for information processing. You cannot remember things you did not pay attention to. So the first and foremost, the information has to register. And in order to register, you must pay attention. So a neuroscientist, Michael Posner, describes this as an orienting and executive attention, whereby we deploy resources to sounds and light stimuli in order to bring that information into our brain. And so some other researchers, you know, Grady and his colleagues have said that whatever is not registered is not remembered. And all these things to me sound very like, of course, like commonsensical, but many, many people complain about memory. And in fact, they can, if they really, really get their attention under control, their memory will significantly improve. Well, you know, while I was listening to you and Dr. Clem, I was thinking, oh, well, have I used any memorization techniques? And and I guess the two times in my life when I, when I last really did it, I guess it was I was in college. And I never had any discipline to actually have a technique to do. And it probably explains why I was not the best student. And then I guess I gave a lot of speeches in my professional career, but I, you know, I didn't have to memorize them. I had, I had guide notes that enabled me to, to recall what I needed to recall in, in delivering the presentation. So anyway, can you elaborate again on the linking technique, please? Yeah. You know what? That's a great question you asked because it's one of my favorite techniques. I think as I was talking about earlier, that there is association process where, whereby you take information, hash it out, break it down into smaller parts, and then take each part and create 
some sort of link to your uh, prior knowledge. And, you know, let's take quickly the example of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. These are the planets from the sun in that order. And how do you recall it? And so I'll share with you one of, you know, memory champions, Michael Tipper, who has a blog called uh, happychild.org, or rather um, this story he he talks about. So I thought I'll share that quickly, how he describes he would go about memorizing this order. So the Mercury comes before Venus, then Earth, then Mars. And so he kind of says this is how he creates a story. So Michael says that imagine a huge ball of glowing orange fire that represents the sun, and you can feel the heat coming off of it. And at this huge orange ball, uh, you can imagine like flames dancing around it. So now you have this visual imagery of this orange flaming ball. And then out of this orange ball is a huge tube, and it's a thermometer. As the glowing ball gets hotter and hotter, the mercury inside the thermometer rises. So what he's done now is he's taken this imagery of the orange glowing ball with very, 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 you know, high degree of heat. And now you have a thermometer and we don't need to memorize that thermometer carries mercury. That's the prior knowledge. And so you can now link the orange ball with the thermometer and the mercury is the first planet after the sun. Then he says, eventually the mercury gets so hot that it explodes out of the end of the thermometer with a huge bang and it sprays mercury droplets everywhere. These mercury droplets are tiny silver beads of metal that fall on a beautiful blonde goddess wearing a white toga. And guess what? This lady exudes love and compassion because she is the goddess Venus. So now so now the link is that the mercury explodes and almost uh, breaks into this tiny silver ball. And now they look like a part of an or- ornament. And who will wear it? And nothing but most beautiful woman on this uh, imaginary woman on this uh, on this uh, solar system, I guess it's Venus. So now, so he goes on and on. And I think uh, what I love in this example that many times I think people struggle, like you said, you describe yourself as not the best student. What to me, that means that you never really paid attention to your own learning process. But I don't think you lack these abilities. If somebody nudged you to develop these skills, you would do them really well. What the teachers can't really do or educators can do is like you can't take a Michael Tipper's technique of imagining an orange, you know, flaming ball and a thermometer popping out of it. That has to be something personal to you. So the associations need to be personal. And that's where I think giving time to students to create these personal associations is something that is not built into daily life. And that's why these linking techniques, which are easy and accessible, but may not be implemented. Well, no, it's funny you say that because you mentioned earlier that how important attention, paying attention is in this. And so the study of space and astronomy was always fascinating to me. And so I did pay attention and I could rattle off the order of the planets without any kind of process because I was just into it and and paying attention and reading about it. But most subjects in school were not of interest. And so I didn't really pay attention. And that's why I struggled. But you're right. As you said, it's, it's not a gift. It's a skill. And I just never worked on developing this skill. So Great, great stuff. All right. So I guess before we wrap, Sujeda, any any final closing thoughts? Yeah, you you kind of summarized it yourself that memory is a skill and that skill can be acquired and it can be certainly it can certainly be improved with the right techniques. The critical thing is that a very few people actually know how to improve memory and memory improves with intentionality. So strategizing uh, learning to retain and recall information is very much an intentional process. The uh, important thing is that visual uh, domain, uh, you know, brain has larger area uh, allocated for visual spatial information than for auditory information. So using visualization can be a key and it is the strongest approach for better memory. Then memory champions and those uh, with um, really great memory in the world have uh, all cultivated powerful techniques and the self-discipline to use them consistently. (laughs) <laughs> so, you know, University of California, Irvine researcher Aurora Laporte, who studies individuals with highly superior autobiographical memory, or sometimes called as hyperthymesia, 
uh, found that uh, they even those individuals don't score high on routine uh, memory tests. So to do well on memory, you must practice and bring intentionality. So do not be fooled by people who say, oh, I got that. Uh, like you said, with interest, there, there's likelihood that you will retain information with less effort. But any information you want to retain, if you put effort, you can retain it really well. Great, great stuff. Well, I may try that and, and learn like 10 decimals on pi just to see if I can <laughs> if I can develop the skill a little bit more. All right. That's all the time we have for today. On behalf of our host, Ucheta Kamath, and all of us at Cerebral Matters, thank you for tuning in and listening today. And we look forward to seeing you again here next week with our second conversation with Dr. William Clem. We'll see you then. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive functions. To contact our host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive functions, visit her website at CerebralMatters.com. That's CerebralMatters.com. Tune in next week for the next informative episode of Full Prefrontal.